Corey, I'm so happy to have you here. We were just chatting before we clicked record. And sometimes those are some of the best conversations of just kind of unpacking the journey of getting here and truly what life has looked like up to this point. And you've worn so many hats. You have so many versions of your story and your journey. But I want to take it back to really where it all started, becoming a teenage mom and the evolution of mom life and what that's looked like for you. So one of the things that we really stand behind at Mama Has Goals is that mom life looks so different to everyone and that we can take on this title that we all share, but it can look in so many different ways. And you've done that in your own life. It's looked so different in so many different ways. So I'd love for you to just bring us up to speed in where you're at now as a mom and where you maybe thought you were going to be when you were <laughs> first stepped into teen mom life. Oh, thank you so much, Kelsey, first of all, for having me. Um, so mom life, I, you know, it's funny because we go back and we talk about like, what did you dream of being when you were a little girl, right? Or a little boy. And I, it's all I've ever wanted. It's just, I wanted to be a wife and a mom. I can remember saying that from a young age. And so when I got pregnant early, obviously not ideal, but it never scared me. Mm -hmm. It's like, I got this. I know, I, I know I was born to be a mom. And so um, I was very fortunate to be with someone that I had loved for a long time. Um, we were high school sweethearts. And so it's just like, it felt right. We didn't get married right away. Everyone was like, push, 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 push. You should get married. Well, no, nope, that's what you say I should do. But when I do this, I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. Yeah. Um, and that kind of just defined who I was as a mom right from the beginning is like, this is going to be my way. Um, and I have expectations for myself and that's how I'm going to be a parent to my child. Um, and it just kind of progressed from there. We were young. So it was four years before we had our second child. I finished school, finished college, you know, a lot of dot a dog kind of tried to get some foundation, had our second child and, um, and then life kind of slapped me in the face again. And I was diagnosed with some chronic pain and uh, disease and autoimmunities. And it was just like kind of cut off at the legs, right? We mm -hmm. felt like we, um, your identity is kind of taken away in a lot of yeah. ways. Even though I was a mom, I was still working. And so um, we had to relook at things and um, got through some of that, dealt with some of that. And we were given a gift of another option. And that was um, through foster care and adoption. And so then we began that journey. And through that journey, I got to be a mom, <laughs> temporary or permanent to 21 different children. And it was a blessing like no other. Um, yeah. One that I never saw in my future, but because I was just open enough to receive what was out there, it came. Um, and so now I'm the mom of six and um, I couldn't feel more blessed or honored to be there. Um, at this point in my life, things look a little different. I'm not a stay at home mom on anymore. I, I am a stay at home mom because I work from home, <laughs> but I work. Um, so it, it's a little bit different, but it's still very exciting. And I love the fact that I get to um, leave this legacy for my children of being brave enough to step outside the comfort zone and outside of what uh, maybe our culture and our society says is what we should do um, and do what feels good to you. Um, and that's where I'm at right now. I'm doing what feels good to me and what feels right in this part of our life. Yeah. And we all want that, right? We want to be able to be like, I'm going after what feels good to me. I'm making my decisions. But sometimes when you're in it, that's so hard because yeah. you're just trying to go through the motions. And especially when that chronic physical pain comes in, you are like just trying to get out of bed or you're trying to be able to physically pick your kid up and be able to do the small things. So how did you make that first transition? When you first started having that pain, you have two little kids. I know you were saying you walked them to school often. How were you able to even take the first step when it was just like, I'm in so much pain and life is really hard right now? Um, like you said, it wasn't easy at all. Um, I, I can still go back and think about those first couple of years after my initial diagnoses and what those look like. Um, I still remember like this visual of like crawling down the hallway um, because I couldn't walk. I couldn't lay. Nothing, everything hurt. Um, and so it was it was shattering. Honestly, it was mm -hmm. shattering. But I had amazing physicians. And I can't say that that was like my whole life. Um, just at that specific time, I had some amazing physicians in my life that were so supportive into a diagnosis that was not real supported. So I originally was diagnosed with, diagnosed with fibromyalgia, later diagnosed um, 
along with Hashimoto's. Um, and so I had to kind of fight the system because fibromyalgia has always been a little bit um, political. And so, uh, but my doctor was like, nope, I've been to this conference, this conference. And I said, you know what, um, Dr. E, I don't want to live on medicine. Um, this, it, it literally takes my life from me, right? Because I was on at one point, seven different medications, um, wow. three of them narcotics. Um, I don't want to live that way. And so he supported me in getting off of all of those meds. Um, and then really starting to research and get curious about what other things could possibly help me. And um, that's when I started looking at alternative medicine. Um, um, acupuncture was huge in the beginning. I don't use it as much anymore, but it was really big in the beginning. And then um, massage, um, Cairo, so chiropractic care, um, eating what I was eating. Um, I simultaneously found out I was allergic or very sensitive to several foods and taking those foods out of my diet. Um, but again, it just, because I was, I had to, I had to take the initiative. I had to say, no, this is what I can control. I get to control this. When you say walking, just walking, walking is a lifesaver. If I don't move, I'm, I'm a mess. So for years, walking was kind of it. That's all I did. I was, um, I will own it. I was scared to do too much more, mm -hmm. right? Like, don't cause a flare up, just stay right where you're at. Um, I've since no, I've since found that, you know, muscle strength, yoga are blessings to me without my muscle strength. Um, everything kind of, um, gets a little bit worse. Um, but yeah, eating exercise, um, but knowing my limits, listening to my body. Um, when I start to feel fatigued, stop. Don't, don't let my ego or my stubbornness get in the way, right? Stop, be done. You've done something great. Now what tomorrow might bring a whole different situation. Um, sleep, Ugh, sleep is huge. It's so huge. And how we are sleeping. Um, and if we are getting into that REM sleep so that our body can heal. Um, I've done so much research. I can't even begin to tell you. Um, and that has just helped me because it just, it, it enables me to have that control. Yeah. Yeah. And so we talk a lot about boundaries. I mm -hmm. think that when we go after our goals and we step into motherhood and we start to really define like what type of life we want, we have to set boundaries. But so often it's spoken about with boundaries with others when really it's a lot of boundaries with ourself too. Yes. And I would love for you to talk a little bit about the balance between having boundaries to protect your health or where you're at, but also allowing yourself to imagine more or other. And when I think about it in your story, in just this part of it with the pain is you now wanted to grow your family and you didn't feel that you had the opportunity or you weren't being shown the opportunity to do that within your own body. And so you were given the opportunity to become a mom in a different way. How did you allow yourself to want that and also have a boundary of being like, okay, I just started to feel better. Like if I go and I in put this new thing into my life, am I going to get sick again? Am I going to get more? Can I handle this? How do you, how do you know when you can handle more, but you also need to take care of you? Great question. And I don't think there, I, and there's not a specific answer except for really um, innately knowing who you are, right? Because mm -hmm. I think we all innately are just completely different humans. Mm -hmm. For some of us, um, action is required. Like if we don't yeah. have some kind of action, we're like, I'm just done. Right. So I needed, I needed, I can't even ex express that enough. Like I knew my motherhood journey was not over. Like, and I, I hate to say over because I had two beautiful, wonderful children and I, they were going to be my children forever, but I knew I was born to be more. Mm -hmm. And I thought, Oh, then I'll just go and have, you know, this done, or I'll do that. And Every time I would go and get a consult done, they'd be like, you know, pregnancy with your conditions, you know, might really, you know, do this or do that. And I, and it, I began to take that step back. Okay. Well, where's my boundary? Because I have these two beautiful children at home. I have to be what I need to be for them. Mm -hmm. And I have to be what I need to be for my husband. I made a commitment and a vow to him. Right. And so, um, then this next journey came up and, and I believe me when I signed up for, when we signed up for foster care, we had no idea what it looked like. We were so naive. <laughs> I can't even begin to tell you how naive we were, but I was in this place of knowing that I had more to give. And so I set some early boundaries. Um, 
the county I was in actually, you know, said, you know, you need to get really clear on what kind of children you want in your home. So I knew like birth order was really important to me. They couldn't be older or in the middle of my two biological children because that creates friction. Mm -hmm. And so we knew they had to be younger. Um, so there was a boundary. Um, as we went through that process and that journey, I implied way more boundaries. I mean, there was boundaries about, um, age, there was boundaries about how many children there was, because I mean, honestly, if I would have said, fill me up, they would have filled me up. And that would have yeah. been a lot that would have been too much. So typically, we had one, occasionally two, which would be siblings, very rarely, but there were a couple times we had two or three that weren't siblings. But very, very rarely, I knew I had the capacity for one child, possibly mm -hmm. two children, depending on the situation. And so you just, you know, right? Like you, you can't, mm -hmm. you can't take back, but I'm going to be like really vulnerable here in that 13 year journey. I, I lost myself a lot mm -hmm. because right. You're committed to this, this cause, these children that literally have nothing. And so I lost a lot of myself. I'm not going to like sit here and say, oh yeah, I came out just a walking marathon runner. No, I didn't. I didn't. Um, and actually this personal journey I'm on is because of that. Like I knew after our fourth adoption that we were done. Like I couldn't do this anymore um, physically or mentally, just like it took, takes a lot. And um, so I knew we were done and I looked at myself in the mirror one day and I was just like, yeah, you've kind of let things go. And I don't just mean from a physical perspective, like my whole life revolved around doctor's appointments and caseworkers and advocating and um, case plans and all of this, like, you know, homeschooling and my other two children. So sports and horses and, you know, all these things. And where was I in all of that? Yes, I was their mother, my biggest accomplishment, 100%, but I still knew there was something more. And so boundaries have to start to be set again, right? And that began as physical boundaries, like mom's getting up in the morning to exercise. I'm going to be making food at this time every Sunday, and I'm not doing anything else because I'm meal prepping for the whole year, whole, whole week, right? So there's, again, are more boundaries, but my yeah. kids just know, and I still have those boundaries. I get up early, but they know if they get up early, this is mom's time. Because currently we live in a very small space because we're building a home. So um, like if mom's door is shut, that's exercise time or that's yoga time or that's meditation time. So don't come in. Those are boundaries. We don't think of those as boundaries, though. But if we can't set those simple boundaries for our own personal care, our own self-care, then are we going to set them on the outside for the big things? Yeah, that is so true. That's so important. So how do, what, if someone is really struggling with setting boundaries right now, and maybe it's with their kids, maybe it's with themselves or an outsider, what is the, maybe the first boundary that you would recommend someone setting? I know it's going to be different, but like, what would the first step look like if someone's just like, okay, I'm going to set one small boundary so I can see how that feels where like the first thing I think of for myself is when I said like, no to going to a barbecue. <laughs> like no, I had like true. my schedule, schedule full and we were saying yes to all of these things and I always felt so guilty if I didn't actually have something else going on that I couldn't physically be there the fact of saying no if I could make it happen felt so scary at first and that was like the first boundary I remember setting was like you know what this is just too much and we're gonna have to say no so what is maybe another example like that well it's funny that you say that because the first thing that came to my mind is that no is a very powerful word. Get really comfortable with saying it because we don't, right? Oh, I yeah. can do this. I can. I can. Well, at what cost? And so what I would say is, is find something that really is filling for you. Okay. So um, for some of us, that's exercise. Some of us, that's listening to a podcast, right? Like we just that zone out and just kind of really take it all in. Um, reading, meditation, whatever it is, find something that's really filling your cup and then set a boundary and don't let anything, including a sick child. And, you know, because let's say, OK, I shouldn't say that because if you're a single mom, that's not going to work real well. But, you yeah. know, for for if, if you have a partner you tell them like, this is what I need for this time. You're on period. Mm -hmm. Um, and they step up, they step up. You guys, even when we think they're not going to, they step up. And if, if we can't set a basic boundary with the people that we're supposed to feel the most loved, the most safe, 
you know, the most um, comfortable with, how can we set a boundary with anybody else? So yeah. do something that really fills you because that's going to make you a better person for your kids and your family and your spouse or whoever at any time. And then um, say no or say yes to yourself, but no to everybody else for that period of time. Um, and I always think about things like exercise. You know, I mean, I think as moms, we always say, oh, we don't have enough time. Yes, you do. Yes, yeah. you do. You just have to find it and you have to make it because that's the thing is, is if you have to schedule it on your calendar, then do it, do it, schedule it on your calendar. Yeah. So once you're able to like set boundaries and you're able to get to a space that you can start dreaming and you can start looking forward, sometimes I think it's really hard if you don't have examples in your association or in your network of the type of life you want to live. Maybe someone wants to foster, but they don't know anyone that has, or they want to go and write a book, but they don't know anyone that has, or they just want to have a different job, but they don't know anyone that's ever done that type of job. What are some of the ways that you started finding these new identities for yourself when you had to kind of create them or find people to support you? Well, first and foremost, you, and you keep saying it and what you're saying is this community. Like yeah. you have to really stop and take a step back and ask yourself what you just said. If I don't have anybody right now that's doing the same things I want to do or I'm doing, then it's time to step outside of that. I'm not saying to give up friendships. I'm not saying to say, oh, I don't want to talk to you ever again. But if you're not around people that are doing something, not only that you want to do, but bigger than what you want to do, right? Because that's how we mm -hmm. grow. We see somebody else doing it like, huh. Wow, that's what that looks like. Um, and and getting those rooms. And I have to say, like, I'm in um, Northwest Montana. I live in a population of a thousand people. Okay. Where do I go to grow? <laughs> right. Okay. I'm sorry, but there's like literally our chamber of commerce has four people in it. Uh, <laughs> so I have to get so curious about like, how do I make this look? And so it's things like just getting out there on social media, find somebody that just kind of speaks to you and start following them. Who are they following? Yeah. Books, you know, for me, books have been huge because some of the biggest impactful, um, what do I want to say? Statements that I kind of set my foundation in come from a book. Like I would have never read these books in my entire imagination. I'm like, I would have never read a book about philosophy. <laughs> but here, here I read a book about philosophy every year, a new philosophy yeah. book. I would have never read a book about, you know, uh, I, I'm not, I'm not coming up with examples, but you know what I'm saying? Like you have to just like yeah. step outside. And if you get into those podcasts, let's just say podcasts, you're going to have these book recommendations. And if you're like, huh, I wonder what that's about. And you just take a second to look, you might like it. You might not. I do a, a book list every year. So at the beginning of the year, I choose 12 to 14 books for the whole year at the beginning mm -hmm. of the year. Um, and for some reason, those have come to me in the past, you know, two to six months, let's say. And I buy them all. Actually, I use my Amazon points. <laughs> I use my mm -hmm. Amazon points for them. And I put them on my bookshelf. And I walk over to my bookshelf when I need a new one. And I pull whatever just really feels like it's right there. And you know yeah. what? Lo and behold, almost 100% of the time it's not. But when it's not, because it, it hasn't been, I put it back. And guess what? By the time the year ends, and this happened to me in 2023 really big, by the time the year ends, I pick that book up again. And lo and behold, it is so impactful. Um, but yeah, getting in groups, there's so many women's groups, or like you said, specific groups, foster in um, adoptive groups, um, women wanting to grow, you know, holistic co life coaching groups, whatever it is, there's always a group if you really take the time to just get curious about it. And it's not going to be a perfect fit every time. And I think yeah. that's the problem is in our culture, we just think, well, if I said I was going to do this and then it didn't work, I failed. And that failure is a bad thing, right? Yeah. But what if it's just, you learned something about yourself. You learned something mm -hmm. you didn't know before. Riding motorcycle. I can't tell you how long I've wanted to ride a Harley. Like my whole life, I've wanted to ride a Harley. My 40th birthday, my husband gets me lessons so I can go through and get the lower insurance. I go through that class, scored 100% on the written, did my my driving. I looked at the instructor and said, don't bother. I don't ever want to ride a Harley. 
this. I, I was like, hell no, this is scary. Right. I, but I tried and I don't consider yeah. that a failure because I learned something so important at that point in my life. It was so important to me to do this. I learned something about myself. And I think when we talk about like even little things like going and finding a community of people, don't put so much worth in it. Just go out and mm -hmm. try and see what you find because it's amazing what you learn. Yeah. You know, you remind me of just like making mom friends, right? <laughs> Where you can go up and you can say hi to someone at the coffee shop, the grocery store, the park, wherever you are. And that person may not be for you at all. And right. you might learn about yourself walking away being like, gosh, why do I not want to be friends with that person? What is it about that person that I'm just like not feeling it? Yeah. But it doesn't mean that you failed not making another friend or anything like that. It's just learning something new about yourself. And I think that that is so, so important in all these different areas, whether it's making friends or riding a Harley or yes. starting a new job or business or anything else is like, you don't know if you don't try. Right. And if you, I mean, I think back even to your fostering journey, it's like you could have taken in your first foster child and been like, this isn't for us. But it, that wasn't your story and your journey. 21 children later, you've been able to have this be such a huge chapters of your life mm -hmm. that you wouldn't have known if no. you hadn't tried. And I think that just shows up in so many different ways. So getting in community, you can see these new examples of where you can maybe try new things. Mm -hmm. But like, I think it just comes back to this determination and confidence, like at the very core where how do you step into that confidence? How do you step into that determination to even like get up in the morning? It, it kind of goes back to the chronic pain question of like, you have to take the step each day. So, and only you can do it. So when yeah. you're sitting there, like, how do you get yourself to say, let's try something new today. Let's go and do this. So I think part of it is being a mom. Okay. I think honestly, because I have to tell you like growing up, I was a very insecure, <laughs> very shy little girl. Um, I had no confidence, none, none at yeah. all. Um, and so where did it come from? Well, from being a mom, because here's the thing is like, I, I honestly, like the foundation of me is, is the legacy. What have I left for my children? What have yeah. I left that? I don't mean finances. I don't care about financial things. I really don't. People are like, well, you don't want to leave them this. No, I don't care about that. I want to leave them this legacy of courage, this legacy mm -hmm. of what it looks like to try new things, to break the cycle. That's the big thing, mm -hmm. like breaking the cycle. If you don't like the cycle that is before you, break it. And I say that because when you talk about chronic pain, my dad, I grew up, um, my mom and dad were divorced, but I grew up knowing my dad and being around him. He had, he had five or six back operations in my life wow. and he had chronic pain and he was the most angry, mean man I will ever know. I'm probably not ever know, but he, that I knew as a child mm -hmm. and I knew right then, like I would never be him. I would never do that to my children. And then lo and behold, what gets thrown at me? Oh, chronic pain, right? As a later in life. And I had a choice to make. Do I let it define who I am or do I define who it is? Mm. And that was just, that was not even a question in my mind. I will never be angry. I have days of pain and it hurts and it sucks. And it doesn't, it's not fun to be a parent on those days because you want them to crawl all over you or whatever it is. And it hurts to have that happen, but you get to choose, you get to choose. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they can sit next to you with a blankie and we can read a story. You know, I have a coaching client who has really difficult pregnancies and she wanted to get pregnant so bad with her third child. And she was so fearful of it. And I said, Becky, but how do you, well, I shouldn't have said that name, but how do you look at how do you look at this situation? How do you um, define what that looks like? It doesn't mean you have to get up and take them to the park, but what about yeah. making a fort on the living room floor and reading stories? To them in their minds, that is the best day ever, right? Yeah. And so like, let's take our ego out of it. Let's take our um, define what makes us successful as parents or whatever it is and just make it, be what it is, it, what it mm -hmm. is. And so for me, it was the legacy of leaving my children. Um, and I think everything I've done in life kind of comes to that, but like, we've had some really big things happen the last few years. And it's just that same thing. It's like, I don't want them to ever say, well, mom and dad worked in the same job for their whole life, even though they were miserable pigs and retired with a, a pension. And so they're successful. 
No, mm -hmm. no, no, no. I want you to see us define what joy looks like, define what success looks like. I want to leave them the legacy of saying, be brave to break whatever barrier you're looking at and look at it differently. Because if it's not bringing you happiness, we don't know. We don't know our, our life expectancy. We don't know. We got a death certificate the minute we were, took our first breath. Let's be honest. We did. We yeah. don't know what it looks like though, right? We kind of talked about that before this. We don't know when our last breath is going to be. And so we have to truly not waste it. Mm -hmm. And so that's that defining that, that motion, that, that forward mo movement. And I think that's what I'm always doing is, is taking forward movement. Um, I don't have like this magic answer. I'm just life is so freaking cool. Like it's so cool, right? It's so, yeah. I'm so curious about it. Like, oh my gosh, even when the hard things happen, like how can I move through this? How can I be the best version of myself today and then tomorrow and then the next day? Because those are the things my kids remember. Those are the things I remember. Those are the things that anyone around you remember. The, yeah. the stranger that you smiled at, right? They yeah. remember that. They remember that. That could have been the worst day of their life. And then all of a sudden they were like, oh, there is still kind people in this world. Yeah. Yeah. I was joking with a friend the other day, not joking at the same time. And we were talking about how when we make choices, sometimes they end up being harder than if we hadn't made that choice. Sometimes just living through the motions is easier in the moment, but that when we decide to like push the boundaries and go into our goals, sometimes it can feel harder. And we just kind of joked, we said, you know, no one lays on their deathbed saying I got by and I was happy about it. <laughs> <That's so true. laughs> and so you have to kind of push yourself through and say, you know what, th you're building those stories and you have that curiosity problem solving mindset to say like, what is this going to mean for me? And how can I push through and what can that look like? You also have this really interesting dynamic in your life right now where you're still a very active mom with young children, but you're also a grandma. Yeah. And I would love I'm a for nana. A nana. A nana. nana. A nana. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what that looks like wearing both hats so actively and kind of how you show up as these different versions of nana and mom mom to the now mother of the little kids, and yeah. then also mom to your current kids that are still in the household, where do you find kind of this balance into the, all the different versions of you? Well, <laughs> it, it is still a journey. I, I mean, yeah. like, all vulnerability is still a journey. So I take care of uh, my grandbabies at least once a week, if not twice a week. So there is definitely, like you said, this very active role in their lives. Um, so just let's take a step back for a second. So we moved to Montana um, just less than a, about a year and a half ago. We sold everything we had in Oregon and kind of started over. And uh, my big children, my big boys, I call them my big, the bigs, they call them the bigs, were still in Oregon. And within six months, they both followed us. So they both gave up everything they had and followed us. So we talk about legacy. Remember, that is like, okay, I'm doing something right here because they want to be with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's been weird. It's, it's been weird. It's been hard. It's been, um, so like making me really step outside of what I knew, what I knew. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that's part of, I'm not going to say not part of the reason we decided that we had to be done in the foster adopt journey, because I had to be able to set some boundaries in my home. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when my, my youngest daughter is four, oh, she'll be five this month. And then my oldest grandchild is, who's also a girl just turned four in November. So they're only nine months apart. Wow. And when we had our last one placed with us, we did not know my son was pregnant. My son and his daughter in law were pregnant. So we had no idea, you know, that this was going to happen, but it did. And it, it, it's been wonderful, but there is, there's this a fine line. And so I, Make sure my big kids understand that I am Nana. I am not their children's parent, period. Yeah. I don't care if I care for them. They are my grandchildren. I have waited for this day for a long time. And I want to be the grandparent that they had when they were growing up in mm -hmm. my husband's mom. My husband's mom was just that grandma that you run to, right? Like, And I said, I am not giving that up. So first of all, if you have me care for them, understand it's my way. 
Yeah. And they're like, of course, mom, of course, we would not ask anything else. So there's that. So there's number one boundary. Number two boundary. This has been a hard one. We're still working on this. You are not your siblings' parents mm -hmm. because they're older, right? They want to boss them around. No, they have two parents. They don't need two more or four more in, the, in our cases because of, you know, we have daughter-in-laws too. They have two parents that are very capable. So you are not their parent. You are their sibling. Be their friend. Now, if yeah. something's wrong, obviously you need to come to me, but you're, you're there to be their big brothers. Like they need big brothers. Right. And then three is like, um, so with my youngest, it's really with my youngest that we have to do this is like, I always say to her, well, I'm not the, I'm not my Thea is my granddaughter. I'm not Thea's mom. I'm your mom. Right. And so I'm yeah. setting the boundary with her right now. Like it doesn't matter if it looks different. I'm your parent. This is the way, because it doesn't matter if it's my grandchild and my daughter that, I, that she's getting this with, she's going to get it with somebody else's parents, right? Somebody else's parents let mm -hmm. their, their kids get on Facebook. Well, I'm not them. These yeah. are our rules and you live in this home and these are our rules. And so these are the expectations that we're going to hold you to. And honestly, in the grand scheme of things, it's been nothing but beautiful, but it's hard. I'm not going to yeah. lie and say it's not. It's hard. Um, there's days I just want to throw my hands up in the air and go, well, there's that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's part of life though, right? Yes, like yes. we were talking about this earlier, like some days it's not going to look good. Some days it's not going to look beautiful, but at, at the grand scheme of things, it is. Yeah. And so it's figuring out how to push through those harder days to look back and look at the big picture and be like, wow. And I always think about this as like a book or a movie, right? Where if like we're watching a movie and the whole movie was just, you know, I, I'll make fun of Hallmark movies for, yeah. for an example. Even Hallmark movies have drama. They have yeah. ups, they have downs. That's what keeps you going through the movie. Where if it was all just kind of like, blah, like this is how it's going to go, no one would watch it. They'd right. be like, well, that, like there was no plot to that movie. There was no plot to that book. And so I think it's, we have to remind ourselves of that. Like there, there's going to be dips. There's going to be hills that you have to climb, but it doesn't mean that having this beautiful combination of being Nana and mom at the same time is such a beautiful opportunity for you, even when you're like, gosh, this was really hard to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and figuring out how to have those conversations. Um, if there was someone that is in a similar situation of some sort, uh -huh. and there was like a habit or a routine or a sentence that you even say that would help, I think one of the ones you gave that I definitely could see being so important is like, you're not that person's parent, you're their sibling. And I'm not that person's parent, I am Nana or grandma. I think that right there is such a huge takeaway. Is there anything else that you're like, this is kind of what we come back to as like our foundational guide when we're going through this? Um, I think it's, you know, kind of our foundational guide as parents, period, is that um, we're human too. Um, yeah. And we're going to make mistakes and we show how it looks to have grace with ourselves and how, how easy it is to say, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I, I made a mistake and I'm going to, I won't do that again because it doesn't matter how long you're a parent for like being a parent today compared to 20 years ago is completely different. Right. So I have to learn new things all the time. And right now I'm parenting teen girls. Well, before it was teen boys. Well, that's like two different worlds. <laughs> right. And so yeah. it's just like, it's having those authentic trans, just very vulnerable conversations about, you know what? I had to do it just the other night. I sat the four younger ones down and yes, I say all four of them because my almost five-year-old is still in those conversations. And I said, you know, I am not the same mom that I was when we were in Oregon because I was a stay-at-home mom. That was my sole responsibility. Yeah. And I have these other things and they're so fun and cool. And I can't wait to see you like be a part of them and see how they grow and how they um, expand. I said, but I can't do it all anymore. That was really hard for me because, yeah. you know, I'm a doer and I said, you know, I have to have help. Dad has to have help. My husband is building our home full time. So he's still working full time, even though he's not in his job that he was in in Oregon. I said, so it's time. You guys, I shouldn't have to ask you to do the dishes. Just do the dishes, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and that's those are hard, vulnerable conversations because we want to be everything. I don't know why we want to be everything, but we do. It's just, it's human nature. We should do it all, right? And having those conversations of just saying, I can't do it. Or yeah. 
I messed up. I'm sorry. I really messed up. Um, but here's what we're going to do. Or just calling them, right? Like calling them to the plate. Because I think I think too many times we're, we're worried about what our kids think. Like, mm -hmm. and I don't mean that because my kids have a voice in our home. Like we have these very open, intimate conversations all the time. And it's just like, but I'm not your best friend. I'm not your best friend. I want you to have a best friend outside of me that you can tell them how horrible their parents, your parents are, because the fact of the matter is they don't, they all come back and say, let's go to, let's go to their house because their parents are really cool. Right. Because, because <laughs> we're open, we're yeah. honest, we're vulnerable. We're, we're all those things. We're not, we're not parents. We're humans uh, yeah. that just have to make sure that these kids are safe and taken care of. Um, and so just being that, just being that, just being human yeah. and, and reminding ourselves that we can always be a better version of ourselves. We don't know it all. I think that's one of the hardest things about parenting for me is the parents that think they know it all. You don't know it all. None of us will ever know it all. Um, and if you don't co continually evolve as a parent, you're going to miss out. Yeah. That's so important. The continual evolution as a human and yeah. as a parent. And so let's talk about your evolution. You were doing bookkeeping yeah. and you still are, but you're also now supporting women in some of the things that you've overcome and you can help them as well. What does that look like? If someone's like, oh my gosh, I, this is what I need support with. So, um, yes, I recently have become certified as a holistic life coach. And the main reason behind that is because of what it gave me personally. Like I just, yeah. I wanted to go through the whole process. Um, but what I found is, is that I can help other people, right? We don't put that value on ourselves. Oh, I have nothing to give, but I do. I have so many chapter stories of those things. And so um, I am doing some one-on-one -on -one coaching. I'm doing um, with women um, for a variety of reasons. You know, like, like I said, um, one of my clients was just having some real personal things that she didn't deal with. Another one was young, super young, wanted to do some solo travel. How do I get curious enough and courage, courageous enough to do that and kind of walk through that process? Um, I do a lot of personal finance coaching, right? Because I am yeah. a bookkeeper and I do do that. Um, and um, a lot of speaking is where I would like to go because I really feel like um, through stories, we have so much impact. And I have so many stories that I love to share because I do feel like that connection when um, you get to just really be in a room with people is so, is so under... Um, what do I want to say? Is people just don't understand how impactful it is to people. Yeah. And so I'm um, doing some speaking. Um, and I don't know. Like that's the thing. I don't know where the rest of it looks. I've um I've really been handed some messages about doing something to support the foster community. Um, I don't know what that looks like yet. And what's really cool is is that I'm not scared. I I don't need to know what it looks like. I know that whatever is meant to be is gonna come. And I'm going to be able to support the community, um, the children, the the workers, whoever it is, in whatever fashion I'm supposed to. But um, I am passionate about foster care, so I know I'm supposed to still be there somehow. It's just not as a foster parent. Yeah. And I think it's so important to see that you can have a role in something, but what that role is can evolve. Yes. And this seems so normal to people to understand when it's like a job, right? Like you can take a different job in a company or you can step from full-time to part-time, or you can go do that title in a different organization and it'll look different. But we don't always remember that it can look that way when it's like parenting or yes. showing up as the school like classroom mom uh -huh. or <laughs> showing up in just like what lights you up. And I think that that is so important to remember, like you can stay involved in something and it can look different and it doesn't have to be the exact same version of what you were doing before. So I absolutely love that. If anyone can connect with you, what are the best places for them to find you? Where can they continue to follow your journey? Um, my website is always a way to contact me. B as in like the bubble B, B E E, authentically you.com. Um, I'm on Instagram, your story, your journey. Um, and um, yeah, so definitely reach out. Uh, there's always a way to find me there. And um, just have open a conversation. You know, it's like I my kind of my words for 2024 is collaboration and connection. And I am just I am like embracing that. I just want to have these conversations and these um, these opportunities to get people a little bit more like, oh, 
that nudge. Remember that nudge, that yeah. innate, that in, it's in you, it's in you, it's in all of us. We just have to listen a little closer. And that, um, that looks different for each of us, but it's um, taking just a little bit of courage and a little bit of confidence, or maybe not, you know, because I think about that. I didn't have confidence when I started this in anything. I would have never guessed this. It was just courage. And then yeah. you get confidence, right? When, yeah. you do, when you do it and you do something and you're like, oh, that felt good. The, all of a sudden, then the confidence starts to follow. I don't think we start with confidence. I think we have to earn it. I agree. I think that was beautifully, perfectly said. You have to do the reps to earn the confidence. And it's really just kind of naive courage <laughs> to step into whatever it is that's on your heart and calling. But I think it's so important. And, you know, a couple people say this different ways and can be credited for it. But if you don't take action on whatever's on your heart or that you're thinking about or feeling, it's going to eat you alive. So yes. you have to take some version of action to earn that confidence to see what is right and what is next for you. This yes. was such a good conversation, Corey. We could go on for hours. But if you were to give our listeners just one thing to do today to whether it's earn that confidence to step into that courage or just get curious and dream and go bigger just all of the things that you support women with and have done for yourself what is one thing that they could do today with what they have with no, no other needs i would say um so with what they have so they have a phone so go on and find either one new podcast or one new community group and start listening. You don't have to participate. Just start listening because there's these little tidbits in it and it's going to start giving you your nudge, a little bit of fuel. And then in that fuel, then you're going to start getting that courage to see what happens. You know, Jen Sonero says, in order to live a life you've never lived, you have to do things you've never done. And it's just the little things even like listening, listening, um, one of the things that has been the most impactful for me is getting in community. So I would have to say, get in some kind of community that are not the people that are doing the same thing that you're doing. They have to be where you want to go or where you think you want to go. Yeah. And of course we love the mama has goals community and podcast, but what is another podcast that you resonate with that you would love for the person that can go push play immediately today? Oh my God. There's so many. I know. <laughs> There's so many. I know. Uh, the permission slip community with Carmen Oling. I, I I think she covers so many different things and she really calls you to the plate. She doesn't let um let you kind of be the person that cops out. Uh, yeah. But that's just there's so many. Rachel Luna. I I can I can keep going on and on and on. <laughs> Yeah, so good. But the fact is you start with one and then yes. those, that's how you find more. And that's how you kind of hit this domino effect of your connection, collaboration, community building. So that is amazing. I love Carmen too. And <laughs> um, definitely would definitely link, will link the Permission Slip Community podcast below. Perfect. But Corey, thank you so much for being here. If you, you have so many exciting things going on as you step into this journey, what is one primary goal or primary focus that you have for this year that you're really just excited about? Uh, all women's retreat in Costa Rica um, that really begins this process of blooming. Um, I'm collaborating with two other women that are kind of in the same space I'm in, and it literally just gives me goosebumps. I am so freaking excited about it. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, I can't wait to hear the details. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.